Nisha is such a talented writer, and I knew that. I had seen her poems before, and I knew that we can come up with all kinds of reasons not to write or to postpone writing. And postponing writing is like postponing practice, practicing the piano if you intend to play Carnegie Hall. You know, you don't do that. You get up and write every day, no matter what's happening in your life. And that's the only way I've managed to get it done. But anyway, I want to thank her for being both a poet and an educator. I have a very strong affinity for teachers. My husband is a high school math teacher. And if you think that is not the definition of being oppressed, <laughs> he loves it. He must, you know, he, he absolutely loves going in at 6.30 in the morning, breaking up at least three fights during the day, teaching a little algebra, then coming home at 6.30 and falling asleep while grading papers in front of the TV as we're both party animals. So I have uh, just a great admiration for people who manage to do the, the most heroic job of all to teach and also to manage to keep art in their lives. Uh, Misha asked me uh, to do something uh, tonight. She said, I want you to read your poems, but I want you to remember that we are learning about poetry, and could you inject something on the craft, the art and the craft of writing poetry? So what I did was I selected mostly from my book, A Love Story Beginning in Spanish, um, and a few newer poems. I won't say they're new. Uh, it, it just means that I've written them since, uh, since I published this book, like in 1995 or something. So it takes me a long time to write poems. Um, the love story beginning in Spanish is not romantic love. Um, it's a love of language. Um, I uh, was uh, a non-English speaker until I was 13 years old. I learned English, and I didn't just learn English. I decided to possess it. And when you fall in love with a language is different than just accepting it, like you know, an old spouse or an old pair of shoes or something. It means that you're in love with the word. And that is what happened to me. Uh, poetry to me has been both a tool um, and a weapon of defense and survival. So my love story is basically um, just a, an obsession with what language can do for you and what you can do with language. So what I decided to do tonight was to ask the question and try to answer it. What, make, what makes a poem happen? Uh, often you call it triggers, but that's a little too facile, I think. Um, we do it to our students all the time. You know, I'll say, here's a trigger for you. Go to an Athens establishment and you know, eavesdrop on a conversation and see if you can make up a story. And you know, for freshman students or whatever, beginning writers, you know, you have to get them going like motivation, motivational coaches, you know. But for poets, I think it's a little more subtle. What makes a poem happen to me is definitely not sunsets and rainbows. You know, that's been done and done and done and done, and even love and sweetness and all this, you know. <laughs> I think that the hardest thing to do is to <laughs> do what Virginia Woolf said was uh, to follow the tracks left by strong emotion back to a moment of being. To really follow what obsesses you and what shaped you back to a moment of being and try to find something to write about in that moment. So for me, uh, it begins with memory. And I have to tell you something. I fully, at this stage in my life, I fully accept the fact that memory is a creative construct. I mean, you are making up the story of your life as you go along, and you cannot claim that memory is fact, that memory is history even. Aristotle said that uh, the role of the poet is to uh, record the emotional history of humankind. The role of the historian is to record the factual history. And when I read that, I said, oh, thank God for these dead Greek guys. They really knew what they were talking about. He released me you know, from having to tell the factual truth when I'm uh, writing a poem. And frankly, if I read you a poem, I, so far I've never had anybody ask me this, is that true? 
Well, actually, I had some fourth graders ask me that. Did that really happen? I said, it doesn't matter. It's poetry. I said, but we're supposed to tell the truth. No, not after you're 21 and you declare yourself a poet, no. But it was a difficult class. Um, so anyway, rather than lecture to you, you can tell I'm an English teacher. Uh, I could just go on for the next 50 minutes and never read a poem. Um, I'll begin with uh, what makes a poem happen, poetry and memory, and poetry as emotional history. And what I'll do is I'll mention the topics, read you the poems, and then at the end of the reading, if you have questions uh, or comments about the process, you know, I can uh, discuss them with you. So this is the first poem in my book, and it's called Beans, an Apologia for Not Loving to Cook, and it's dedicated to my daughter Tanya, who is a, both a mathematician and a wonderful cook and doesn't understand why I can't be a poet and a good cook. Beans. For me, memory turns on the cloying smell of boiling beans in a house of women waiting, waiting for wars, affairs, periods of grieving, the rains, el mal tiempo to end. The phrase used both for inclement weather and to abbreviate the aftermath of personal tragedies and they waited for beans to boil. My grandmother would put a pot on the slow fire at dawn, and all day long the stones she had dropped in, hard and dry as a betrayed woman's eyes, slowly softened, scenting the house with the essence of waiting. Beans, I grew to hate them. Red kidney beans whose name echoes of blood and are shaped like inner organs. I hated them in their jaw-breaking rawness, and I hated them as they yielded to the fire. The women waited in turns by the stove, wrapped by the alchemy of unmaking. The mothers turned hard at the stove, resisting our calls with the ultimate threat of burned beans. The vigil made them statues, rivulets of sweat coursing down their faces, pooling at their collarbones. They turned hard away from our demands for attention and love, their eyes and hands making sure beans would not burn and rice would not stick, unaware of our longing for our mother spirits to return back to the soft sack that once held us, safely tucked among their inner organs smelling the beans they cooked for others through their pores. The beans took half a child's lifetime to cook, and when they were ready to bring to table in soup bowls, the women called the men first in high voices, like whistles pitched above our range, food offered like sacred steaming sacrifice to los hombres. El hambre entered the room with them, hunger as a spectral presence called forth from whatever other realm the women visited when they cooked their bodies remaining on earth to watch the beans while they flew away from us for hours. As others fed, I watched the dog at the screen door, legs trembling, who whimpered and waited for the scrap. I hated the growling of pleasure when at last it got its gory bone. I resisted the lessons of the kitchen then, fearing the Faustian exchanges of adults, the shape-shifting nature of women by the fire. Now it is my daughter who keeps a voluntary vigil by the stove. She loves the idea of cooking as chemistry and the Tao of making food. Her waiting for the beans to boil is a meditation on the transformative properties of matter, a gift of memory food from my island. And I come out of my poem to partake, to share her delight in the art of feeding, like a recently freed captive of a long ago war, capable at last of a peaceful surrender to my old nemesis, El Hambre. So, I will tell you at the end of the reading, if you're interested, why this is an emotional history of the memory. Uh, and uh, I, I wrote this poem when my daughter asked me, Mother, why don't you just learn how to cook? 
And so I decided to write an apologia, which is not an apology, as you know. It's an explanation. It's just a damn explanation. That's all it is uh, of why. And then this poem emerged as truth. So um, the next one is my father was in the Navy. He was in the Navy the entire time I knew him. So he was uh, gone most of the year. Um, I could not return, I could not follow the tracks left by memories back to my father because I only knew what I heard or could imagine about him. I only knew that he was lonely and that he spent six months out of the year um, on a ship out at sea. I only knew that every time he came back he was more silent and more distant. I only knew that at one time he had been a Puerto Rican man who loved playing dominoes. Uh, he was obsessed with them. He loved partying. He loved laughing. And every year he came back and laughed less and did not play dominoes, though he took them with him on the ship uh, always. So when he died, I decided to imagine a memory. And I realized that I couldn't do like my mother and, and think of her cooking or in Puerto Rico or whatever. I had to imagine this man on a ship and I couldn't connect to him, so I did something that I do when I need to make myself go to a poem, and that is I find an object, thing, fact, historical event that can lead me to this thing. So I found two things. My father was in uh, the Navy during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he was in the embargo. So I knew Cuba and Fidel were connected to my father, and the other thing was that I, I, I just read all these weird books. I have a collection of weird books that I find at yard sales, sometimes at Misha's house. But I didn't find this one there. It was on methods of divination, how people through the ages have discovered what they need to know by looking at mirrors or games of chance. So anyway, that's all I'll tell you about this. Dominoes, a meditation on the game. The first record of them comes from 12th century China, where they were used for divination rather than gaming. Dominoes are usually made of ivory, consisting of 28 <laughs> rectangular tiles. Each tile is bisected, and the halves that are not blank bear dots numbering one to six, representing all possible number combinations, ranging from double blank to double six. In their Western incarnation, Dominoes have tended to be far more popular as a game than as a tool for divination. Certain tiles are thought to be lucky for the player, regardless of the outcome of the game. Domino games may go on for years and through generations. There are Cuban men in Calle Ocho who have been playing since the revolution. They have taught their sons and their grandsons to play. There is no end to these domino games. The men play in waves, rising only when the new players come in at sunset, taking up the game the next day. They sit before their rows of black and white tiles, 28 in all, arranged like the headstones of dead soldiers. 28 in all, each tile is bisected, and the halves that are not black bear dots numbering one to six, representing all possible number combinations, ranging from double blank to double six. Certain tiles are thought to be lucky for the player, regardless of the outcome of the game. On January 8, 1959, Fidel Castro led his ragged army into Havana. The previous night, Don Miguel had called the game early after having drawn a double blank under the roof of his own home. In the city, his son Miguelito had drawn a double six and spent the night drunk on his own luck. Don Miguelito plays all day on Calle Ocho. He has taught his son and grandson to play. In their Western incarnation, dominoes have tended to be far more popular as a game than as a tool for divination. Certain tiles are thought to be lucky for the player, regardless of the outcome of the game. In 62, my father, called to duty at sea, left his game in Puerto Rico forever and learned that embargo is an American word. Seen embargo, he had also drawn a double six in his last hand. Aboard his ship, there were no domino games. No one played. He later said the ivory pieces in a cigar box under his bunk clicked like the bones of the dead 
all that long October month when the water between the islands got rough. I can still see him studying the black and white faces, 28 in all, representing all possible number combinations ranging from double blank to double six. I never saw him play again. My father's bones lie under a headstone listing all the wars since his last game. He did not lose his life in a war, but he lost his love of the game. My father's ivory tiles, 28 in all, feel like dry bones in my hands. I cannot play. It is lately that I learned that 6-6 six, six is the luckiest domino of them all, predicting happiness, success, and prosperity, while the direst of omens is a double blank with danger, despair, and death all to be written in black ink on the ivory page. This is an old game. The first record of dominoes comes from 12th century China, where they were used for divination. In their Western incarnation, dominoes have tended to be far more popular as a game. Certain tiles are thought to be lucky for the player, regardless of the outcome of the game. And so one of the things that poetry is, is divination. And it's divination of the self. Uh, if you don't know yourself better after you write poems about meaningful things in your life, then you're playing games. <laughs> you're writing for others, not for yourself. And one of the things that I have learned is whenever I write about my mother or my daughter or the things that I'm close to, I go directly to the source, even if it's not by the straightest route. When I write about my father, I always have to have an outside thing that leads me to him. Uh, the next thing is poetry and literature. Uh, for me, intrinsically connected. Um, teaching for me, and I'm about to leave it, I'm about to retire in the fall. I've been here for 28 years at the University of Miami for three, so give me a break. I, I need to spend one Sunday without papers to grade, if you don't mind. Uh, I've loved it though, and this poem comes from a long time ago when I first started teaching, I, uh, it, teaching is sort of like being in the Naval Academy where you know the, the new people get the 8 a.m. classes, they get beat up all day. And so I, t I was told um, we need someone to teach world literature uh, from Genesis to the Renaissance in the <laughs> afternoon. And I said, no problem, even though my degree was in American literature and, I read the, the Bible last in eighth grade St. Joseph's class. Uh, but um, I said, hey, I can do it. And then they said, and then there's another section, um, the, uh, se the second part of world literature uh, you, it, is to be taught before the first part of world literature. It will be the Renaissance to the present. I said, okay, no problem. And so anyway, um, I ended up immersing myself in these things just going to the Bible and uh, to the uh, library and reading the, the Jerusalem Bible and, and St. James Bible and all that right before I had to teach Genesis and whatever. And, uh, and then I, I had to teach uh, the Odyssey. Uh, and I became very obsessed with, uh, this was the time when my, my daughter says that was, you were uh, a 70s uh, feminist for about 20 years. I was always the 70s feminist, the angry one. So anyway, I was really pissed off because Penelope refused to just get out, you know? She didn't want to leave Ithaca. She had to sit there and weave and unweave and weave and unweave. So anyway, I decided to try to get her out of the house. And I started writing a series of poems um, called uh, A Sailor's Wife's Journal. And, um, and I just wrote them and wrote them, and then I realized, first of all, I wasn't writing about Penelope. I was writing about my mother and our life waiting for father. And the second thing was I'm, I was never going to get Penelope out. She had hooked me. I was now doing the weaving and unweaving. And so after about 13 poems, I just said, you get yourself out. You know, I've had it. So anyway, I'd like to read you just a couple of the letters that she writes to Odysseus while he's out having fun, you know, messing around with goddesses and getting stoned with the lotus eaters and whatever, and she's home weaving and unweaving. But she loves him. Okay, from a sailor's wife's journal, and this uh, the epigraph is, but I waste my heart away longing for Odysseus, book 19 of the Odyssey. <clears throat> Dear Odysseus, 
The moon looms over our house, its face split in mockery of my grief. I have seen it change expression six times since you left. Half a year ago, you last made love to me on the lap of this old tree you carved into our marriage bed. The branches you said were the fingers of God, of God's blessing our union seem now to threaten. Their shadows fall across my body, one by one with the movement of the moon. Before your journey, you took me to your ship. Together we watched your men raise the sails. Flapping in the good wind, they were the wings of a great white bird you held captive to move your ship with its desire for flight. To the sounds of its struggle, we came together in your cabin. In the dimness of this man place, you promised me with a thousand kisses that you would return, Odysseus. A sudden gust has swollen the canopy of our bed like the sails of a ship, my ship, Odysseus, a ship that goes nowhere. Dear Odysseus, this morning a lark entered my chamber alighting on the lowest branch of a tree that is our marriage bed. He sang for me. At daybreak, I heard chanting and laughter in the distance. It was a crowd of young worshipers welcoming spring, walking home from the fields they had blessed with wine, songs, and love making. The girls walked arm in arm ahead of the young men whose eyes were fixed on their graceful bodies like mariners first sighting land. When you came for me, we walked on my father's fields and you said green was not the color of your destiny. The sea was calling you even then. Bird song and nursing calf amused but did not hold you. The mystery of earth grown things, the passing of Apollo's chariot were matters for the minds of lesser men, you said. Stars enticed you for their coded messages, Odysseus. The moon was a torch held over the chart of the night sky, so you, forever captain, could plot your next destination. I have begun to see things more clearly, as if my eyes were stronger from willing your ship to appear in the horizon. On the ledge of a window facing the setting sun, I found a moth with nearly invisible wings I wished into flight. I watched the leaf leap down from the branch of a tall tree to ride the gathering wind. I wait for clouds, moving slowly as wounded soldiers to bring me the smell of rain, a distant promise I take in in deep breaths. And so when I say to you that poetry has been divination, it has been looking into my heart. Like Sir Philip Sidney said, the only thing I remember him saying, look into thy heart and write. Uh, and so uh, I found out one other thing about me. Why do I love literature? I mean, why not put my intelligence into the stock market? You know, why not do something other with, you know, my brain? And I realized that literature is life for me, that I never understood my mother or why she waited for my father in the things that came to her in the waiting until I read the Odyssey, uh, that literature reveals yourself to you. And if you can do that for at least one student, you've done something with your life. Um, OK, now place. I've been writing, of course, about the place where I was born, Puerto Rico, the place where I grew up, the inner city of Patterson, New Jersey, the urban jungle, during the um, you know, nearly deadly late 1960s. And then we moved to um, verdant Augusta, Georgia, where I learned how battles are fought without Molotov cocktails, in uh, sweet sounding words. So, um, and, and then I met my husband, who is a deeply devoted Southerner, and I stayed. Um, so I would like to read the first poem I ever wrote about the South. Uh, it was about my first year in, the so in, in, in Augusta, Georgia, uh, we had moved from a barrio in New Jersey where you didn't learn, you didn't need to know English. Everything you needed was there. The bodega, el bazar, esto y aquello. My mother didn't have to speak Spanish. Um, and then we moved to Augusta during the um, riots in New Jersey. Uh, my father said it was temporary, but anyway, my mother was very unhappy. She didn't have anybody to speak Spanish with except me, so she drove me crazy. And so this is about how we were shopping one day and we stopped at this place like you have in the South, like we have in the South, I'm from the South now. Like we have in the South, which you know, in some places you have bake shop, bakery, auto repair, and um, 
you know, therapy. Uh, and not so much now, we're so much more sophisticated. I did visit Alabama the other day though, and across from the restaurant where I ate, there was the uh, uh, Jesus Saves Beauty Shop. Come in and the Lord will transform you. <laughs> I have pictures, I'll send it to you. The Jesus Saves Beauty Shop, come in and the Lord will transform you. It was all I could do not to go in. You know, please do everything, the whole makeover. You know? So anyway, it's part of the charm of the South. So anyway, this is the first, first job, the Southern Sweet Sandwich Shop and Bakery. Uh, I was talking to my mother, uh, this voluptuous woman, the waitress came out and, and said, Honey, what kind of foreign are you talking? And I said Spanish, and my hair was really long. And she started to braid it. She said, I love your hair. And I said, good. She says, you want a job? I said, yes, please save me from my mother. So anyway, uh, I took this job, and, and, um, and I learned some things. I learned all about sex and from watching her. Uh, how to you know do it without doing it and uh, see this is the kind of thing we have to edit out I'm sorry uh, she's probably still alive and still voluptuous but anyway so the only things you need to know about this what this was the year that Hank Aaron was beating Babe Ruth's record um, you know it was an empowering thing the black cook in the kitchen never spoke up except when she was listening to the game. Then she would hold up a finger and nobody better ask her to make a sandwich when, you know, Hank Aaron was up. Um, and the other thing is that there is a word that um, National Public Radio asked me to do a reading and when I went to read this, they had to take a meeting about it until I pulled out the OED and I, told, and I proved to them that the word was not an obscenity, it was merely a vulgarism. And I'm not going to tell you which it is. If you don't know this much Spanish by now, you really should learn a little. Yeah. First job, the Southern Sweet Sandwich Shop and Bakery. <clears throat> Lily Mae glows. She hates the word sweat as she balances a platter of baked sweets over her head, showing me how to walk with grace even under the weight of minimum wage and a mountain of cookies, turnovers, and tarts, which she blames for her voluptuous figure. She calls me sugar and is teaching me the job. We're both employed by Mr. Raymond, who keeps her in a little house outside of town. I'm 15, living my first year in this strange country called Georgia. Lily Mae hired me for my long black hair she couldn't wait to braid and for my gift of tongues, which she witnessed as I turned my mother's desire for a sugar bubble she called the merengue into something nearly equal behind the glass wall. Sugar, she will on occasion call me out front, talk foreign for my friend, and I will say whatever comes into my head. You're a pig, Mr. Jones. I see your hand under the table stroking her thigh. If they're impressed with my verbal prowess, I may suggest something tasty from our menu. If they presume I'm Pocahontas at the palace, there only to amuse their royal selves, I tell them, smiling sweetly, to try the mierda, which is especially good that day. Soon I can make anything sound appetizing in Spanish. Lily Mae carries her silver-plated tray to Mr. Raymond for inspection, looking seductive as a plump Salome in her fitted white nylon uniform. He is a rotund King Herod, asking for the divinity, though he knows is on its way. She sorts her delicacies, pointing out the sugar-coated wedding cookies with the tips of her pink gluon nails she's so proud of because sugar a woman's hand should always be soft and beautiful. Never mind, you scrubbed, waxed, pushed, pulled, and carried all blessed day. That's what a man expects. I watch them as they talk shop and lock eyes, but cannot quite imagine the carnival of their couplings. Instead, I see them licking their chops over strudel consuming passion while ensconced in her edible house with peppermint stick columns and gingerbread walls. In the kitchen of the southern suites, the black cook Margaret worships at the altar of her zenith radio, 
Hank Garren is working his way to heaven. She is bone sticking thin, despises sweets, loves only her man Hank, Otis Redding, and a smoke. She winks at me when he connects, dares to ignore Mr. Raymond when Aaron is up. Mysteriously, the boss man understands the priority of home runs and the sacrilege of speaking ordinary words like my triple decker club on a bun with fries. Frozen a tongue tip when Margaret holds up one bony finger at us, demanding a little respect for the man at the plate. That windowless kitchen with its soul melting hot floors and greasy walls had to disappear for her. Like a magician's trick at the sweet snap of the ball and bat that sent her into orbit, her eyes rolling back in ecstasy, mouth circling the O oh in wonder as if she had seen the glory. At closing, Lily Mae fluffs her boot black curls, heads home to entertain her sugar daddy, or be alone, glue on new nails, pin curl her hair, and practice walking gracefully under heavy trays. I have homework to do, words to add to my arsenal of sweet sounding missiles for mañana. My father waits for me in his old brown galaxy. He is wary of these slow talking tall southerners, another race he must avoid or face. Tired of navigating his life, which is a highway crowded with strangers sealed in their vehicles and badly marked with signs that he will never fully understand. I offer him a day old donut, but no. At least for me, he does not have to accept second best anything. We drive by the back lot where Margaret stands puffing small perfect clouds, our eyes fixed to a piece of sky between the twin smokestacks of continental can and beyond what I can see from where I am, still tracking Aaron's message hovering above us all in the airwaves. Her lips move and I can read the drawled out, shit. <laughs> Followed by that char characteristic shake of her head that meant, girl, in this old world, some things are still possible. Anyway, um, the next one uh, is about yard, yard sales. Catherine, my friend who's sitting back there, my loyal friend, is a Shakespearean medievalist poet and writer who is also a yard sale addict. Why do we do it? Well, because it's like a treasure hunt and because we come up on the most wonderful stories. In fact, we've been writing orally the book of yard sales is a twofold book. One, how to have yard sales, such as post the damn signs, you know, <laughs> with arrows. And don't make it look like you're having a birthday party because we have on occasion tried to burst into a kid's birthday party <laughs> thinking it's a yard sale. Uh, things like that, but the stories we find are fantastic. One time we came into this magnificently arranged man's garage with very expensive tools, all for sale, like 50 cents, a dollar, whatever the woman said. Come and get it. He left me for a younger woman. All must be gone before he comes home tonight, you know? <laughs> um, or something like that. I, do, I, I don't know if you remember that one, I do. Um, and I thought, whoa, you know, um, they're almost too good to write, you know? But anyway, uh, this one has to do with something much more serious. Uh, first of all, well, the, the other thing that's not serious is that GPS devices were invented for Catherine and me because neither one of us has a sense of direction. It's, the only thing is that she's a hopeless optimist and she thinks she'll always find her way out. And I know that we won't. Uh, often I have said, if we can't get out of, out of this neighborhood, we'll have to knock on a door, live with people you know, and let them take us in because we've gone around and around. So we do have a GPS, you know, and Catherine will sweetly say, oh, just shut her up, just Miss Garman, we call her. Hush, Miss Garman, you know, because she thinks she knows where she's going. So anyway, um, I wrote this and dedicated it to, to Catherine because it has to do with two events. We were out in this crazy town where Barnett uh, shows it's an endless road and it changes name suddenly. 
um, and we don't know that it's changed names. We think we're in a different road. Uh, and uh, we often have found ourselves completely lost out in the woods. And uh, one time we were out in front of a, a cotton field and uh, Catherine had been saying, she's a former Catholic, I think she's still a Catholic and just won't admit it, but she's always saying, give us a sign, like in a very religious tone, and what she means is the sign that says yard sale. But she says it, and I said, one day, the skies are going to open, and God's gonna say, I don't do yard sales, you know? <laughs> but uh, she was saying, give us a sign, and all of a sudden, we came upon a field of cotton and there was a barn with a painted Virgin of Guadalupe on it. And uh, that was, you know, um, to former Catholics, that's pretty startling. And the other thing was that I had just been telling Tan uh, Catherine that my daughter Tanya is preg was pregnant with her first child and she's in Chicago. And I said, I don't think I can bear it. She's too far away. I'm scared for her. And so after I read you the poem, I'll tell you how these two things, and this is, how place and, and the occasional um, conjunction of um, almost miraculous symbols will force you to write a poem. And this had to do with the cotton field, the Virgin of Guadalupe, and my daughter uh, having just told me that she was expecting a child. Give us a sign, my friend says, and for a second, I am back in my childhood of rosaries, candles, and incense, kneeling next to mother and grandmother who are pelting God with petitions. Por favor, Dios mío, dame, dame, dame. They're asking him to prove himself through a sign, a healing, a stray husband's return, relief from their female burdens. Show us proof, a small miracle, Papa Dios, of your love for us. My friend is joking. The signs we're looking for are the neon colored yard sale markers. We are hunting and gathering for the sheer pleasure of the drive and each other's company, and certainly for the pre-owned treasures we don't yet know we need, but will as soon as we spot them. Today, we're also talking motherhood, specifically the impending birth of my first grandchild, my joy tempered with concern for my daughter so far from home. Deep into our woman wisdom, we fail to notice we are in unfamiliar territory. No surprise, we're invariably lost on these Georgia roads that change names apparently at someone's whim as Gaines School Road turns to Barnett Shoals and a little further ahead, Whitehall. Or they don't change names often enough. Millage Drive, Millage Circle, Millage Way. <laughs> on this crisp autumn Saturday, we have wandered far off. We see only wood circled with trees still green, but tipped with false gold, and a field of soil so rich red it looks like velvet cake, appetizing. The word comes to mind that of stories I've heard of the cravings for clay of some pregnant women in rural Georgia, driven to seek iron in the soil, drawn like dousing ones to water. Give us a sign, says Catherine, and we come upon a field of cotton snow in September, and just beyond the last row, an old barn. We see it at the same time. I put my hand on Catherine's arm instinctively, as I used to in church, grasping my mother's hand when the hypnotizing Latin and the clouds of candle smoke and incense made me feel as if I would drift up to the cherubim rim cupola like a lost balloon. Painted on the side of that dilapidated barn, the Virgin of Guadalupe floats on her cotton cloud, a brown woman with long black hair and brilliant robes of gold, red, and blue-green, crushing the snake Quetzalcoatl with bare feet, her slightly swollen belly cinched by the black Aztec maternity belt. Serene and majestic, she is with child always. The painting is crude, perhaps done with house paint, yet this apparition over a cotton field in Georgia is the kind of happenstance that empties your head of the mundane, that filters all brain processes down dark passages and into a room you thought you had sealed off long ago, the storing place for questions you no longer need to answer. We slow down but do not stop. We laugh at ourselves, our awestruck faces. Who would take the time to bring the Virgin of Guadalupe to this place and why? 
I imagine a pregnant young woman handing cans of paints and brushes to her man, working after a day in the fields to keep a promesa they have made to the Virgencita for the safe delivery of their child, who will be born in a strange land. We will never be able to retrace our route to this field that will be harvested by workers under the gaze of the Queen of Heaven, or more likely, the mural will be whitewashed or torn down and this land will revert to just another cotton field in the Georgia countryside. On this day, we say no more about apparitions. We keep moving down a road we hope will lead us back to the familiar. We follow the signs and we are lost no more. So um, what the miraculous conjunction of events in this and I use the word miraculous in the ironic way that uh, former or lapsed Catholics must, uh, is that we, I had been talking to Catherine about my daughter's pregnancy and my worry over her having the baby so far away from me. Um, and then the Virgin of Guadalupe appeared, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, uh, and then she's not mine. Uh, you know, all other Latinos wear different medallions. It's because the Virgin, she knows what she's doing. When she appears to someone, she looks like them. She's like the ultimate alien who takes on the shape. You remember the Martian Chronicles? You know, this may have to be edited out too because of the Pope. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I still fear authority. Um, the fact is that uh, the ones in Puerto Rico are different from the Mexican. The Virgin of Guadalupe appeared to an Indian man and she's dark skinned and she wears the colors of the Aztec people. And so I was researching her, you know, so I could, I was thinking about writing this poem and then I found out the most amazing fact. The Virgin of Guadalupe is the only pregnant rendition of the Virgin. The Virgin is always either being told that she's about to have God's child and she's a virgin, or she is this uh, Madonna holding the child, but she's never pregnant in the Western. So she's the only pregnant. So, you know, suddenly, like you're given something. I'm thinking of my pregnant daughter, you know, this is the only pregnant apparition or pregnant rendition of the Virgin of Guadalupe. And uh, it also had to do uh, with place, you know, the juxtaposition of uh, the, uh, the painting of the Virgin of Guadalupe on the red earth of Georgia. And it occurred to me that when people do that, what they're trying to say is, see me. I am working your fields, but I am here, see me. You know, and so it, anyway, that, that was the trigger for that. And it's almost time for me to quit. So I'll read you um, one last poem uh, said in the most unpoetic location, the basement of my condominium in Georgia. Um, I, ha I, I lead a privileged life now, very, very different from the life I led. By very privileged, I mean, I get to be an artist, I get to write, I don't uh, leave my apartment like I did in, in Patterson wondering whether I'll get beat up <laughs> or get involved in, in um, you know, horrendous things that it was a dangerous childhood. And now I can get up in the morning, go to the basement of my condominium and someone else will do my lawn. Of course I have to pay condominium fees, you know, but we won't speak of those. But the, the, the occasion for this was that I was doing my privileged thing, writing on my computer, trying to come up with a poem and you can't force it, you know. It, it just has to come to you or not. And then you clean out the closet or do whatever you need to do in your life, you know. So I was working, trying to put some things down and I heard that ridiculous machine called a leaf blower. Why don't you just let the leaves sit? Why do they have to be blown? That's not a question I, I need answered. But anyway, and so I said, oh no, not the leaf blower. And it came closer and closer. And as I listened to it, I realized that there was a Spanish song being sung. It was a love song by you know, the, the man wielding the leaf blower and he was using the leaf blower to keep time with his song. And I said, if this is not joy of life, you know, then what is? And, and not only that, the love song that he was singing was one that my mother used to play in her old record player 
when my father was away and she would cry being a Latina, you know, and all this. And I, you know, and, and I, the songs would filter through the thin walls of our apartment to me and I guess they became embedded in my head. So anyway, I'll end with listen. Listen. Today, through the walls of the basement room in which I sit, willing myself to write, I hear a leaf, leaf blowers come and go, and above its swinging hum and roar, a Spanish song, sung in the tempo, tempo of latent arms in motion. The words come to me in rhythmic gasps that mimic passion, breaking through the noise of the engine that wants to push away into soggy piles at curbside, el amor, la vida, la tristeza. I think of the Spanish love songs I heard in my childhood, mostly played by my mother on the portable turntable she'd sometimes carry into her room at bedtime. Our walls were porous, made of the thin plaster of transient homes, and her off-key singing along to the broken-hearted hymns of her youth entered my room through keyholes and cracks smoke and scent of sadness that clung to my skin and stayed with me. Today, the leaf blower's unknowing serenade reminds me that I am here to listen. I stop trying to make things up on my screen. All I want is to be silent and still and to think of nothing but canciones de amor. For who am I if not the one who waits to hear the fragment of a love song through the wall, a forgotten melody rising over the engine's noise. Thank you. One more, one more, woo! I'm gonna move this and I'll be next to you, I think, for a moment. I think I got it's water okay. on it. Is there a napkin? Oh, I'll survive. I'll survive. Okay. I'll lean just so that I'm kind of okay. not gigantic I wish next I to <laughs> My daughter is. She's the American blood, you know, from my husband's side. She's eight inches taller than I am, but she has a Puerto Rican temperament. So that makes her a very dangerous American. <laughs> <laughs> what a great reading. Oh, my God. Can you pick, is this okay? Can you hear? I just have a very few questions. Um, and, I, and first, I want to start with gratitude. You're such an amazing reader. This uh, series has no funding. So we have a little gift to you, which I don't think you're going to appreciate very is much. That, is that a drink with alcohol in it? It's actually, it's actually a cookbook. A cookbook? Oh, no. You know what? Wait a minute. I just have to tell you, it won't be wasted. I married well. <laughs> My husband is a, one of the best Southern cooks, and he boasts that to keep me happy, he became the first multicultural cook in America. We got married at 19, <laughs> and he learned to make rice and beans to go with his Southern fried chicken. Oh. So, right, Catherine? Is he not like the best cook oh. that you know? Does he make arroz con gandules? He, you know, he mm. went to my grandmother's house in Puerto Rico, and no man enters that, that kitchen because they won't. Uh, or at least didn't, I'm speaking of another generation, and he's, my husband is 6'4", my, all my relatives are like 4'11". He entered the, the kitchen and my grandmother said, ay Dios mio, did, I, did we do something wrong? He didn't like the food and he just wanted to look under the pots. Uh. And she taught him how to, uh, so I married a southern man for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> me yeah. too, me too. <laughs> well, this book is, uh, you may already have it, New Turn in the South, no. which is totally symbolic. I mean, is she not the New Turn in the South? And it's written by our very own Hugh Atchison. I know him. Yeah, and yeah. It's, a, it's a poetic cookbook. But that's so, so funny, you know, like I know that I look like I should know how to cook. <laughs> You know, I have that look, but I, I can't. And it, it wa oh, if you want me to, I'll tell you the story behind the beans why I don't cook. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll save that for a moment. Because right, or I might not tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we have another gift from the College of Education, our very own mug. I do love coffee. And it actually it. says College of Education on this pen. May you scribe in our honor, please, for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> These are beautiful gifts, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. What a gift to us. Um, I am looking for anyone who wants to co-support, sponsor this wonderful reading series. I, I rely on the goodness of poets who don't seem to be in it for the money. I am in it for the money. I just <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. 
<laughs> for everybody else, pay her a lot. Buy her yeah. books, please, yeah. if you don't own them. They're all amazing. It's my pleasure. <laughs> my question to you is, I just learned today from Craig, who's an English teacher, that poetry is not in the Georgia, how, what, how did you call it? The CCGPS, which are our state the standards. standards. Yeah. Oh, no. That they're gone. Why? Yeah. I, I don't understand that. So, you know, yeah. just, it makes no sense. I mean, poetry is the distillation of language. I mean, when I finally was able to write a decent poem, I knew I knew English. Mm -hmm. Can't mm -hmm. write a poem if you don't know the language. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so that, I, that was my question to you is, you know, what would you advise teachers in light of the fact that usually poetry, if, if it's introduced at all in the English classroom, mm -hmm. it's in late April after the testing is done when it doesn't matter yeah. for Poetry Month, yeah. you know? You know, I don't know what to advise. I'm currently engaged and I've been asked to edit a new anthology of, uh, you know, first year uh, English literature for Pearson. And, and I said, why? I mean, they usually ask like a male professor from Harvard, you know, <laughs> and they said, well, first of all, the, the demographics of the United States are changing. You know, there are people who look like me around. And, uh, and they also wanted a writer's perspective because they find that their students are really intrigued by the notion that a living author is speaking to them, not just somebody telling them what to do. So my portion of this anthology is going to have uh, uh, questions and exercises uh, from the writer's perspective. You know, how do I read that's different from like other people? How do they read? Uh, where do my ideas come from and all that? So that was hopeful to me. Uh, I visit a lot of high schools and a lot of um, middle schools because my stuff has, uh, luckily, I, it's in a lot of anthologies, um, many, many English anthologies. Uh, mainly I'm asked to come in to talk about fiction, and, but I'll, I always read poems anyway, and the kids seem to love it and they like writing poetry. So I don't understand. It could only be that the people banning poetry probably fear poetry. Mm. There's a lot of fear of poetry. I don't understand that, so why should I be asked to teach it? Mm. You know, uh, so uh, that, that saddens me mm. to think that, that kids are not getting poetry mm. in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. I but I, I, I unfortunately, unfortunately don't have a, an answer because this seems to be so politicized. Uh, lately, you know, uh, the idea of what should the kids should be taught and whether they should all be taught the same thing. So I think you guys are going to have to change the system. The teachers are going to have to demand some things for their students. And then when they do, they lose their job. Sometimes they really yeah, do. It's very risky. Yeah. yeah. It, it seems like a conundrum, yeah. you know. I, I have a question about the bilingualism. You know, I fell in love with Spanish too, that mm -hmm. it's my second language. and. You used um, hambre at the end of the yeah. Beans poem. Uh, and hombre and hambre. Oh, hombre and hambre. Yes, and you yes. used sin embargo and embargo. Yeah, yeah. Nevertheless, but you don't necessarily translate. And no, I wonder I don't. how you think about using the two languages. I trust my readers to be intelligent, you know, uh, and if they're uh, going into the uh, territory of poetry, surely they can get up and look up a word if they, if they don't know it. Uh, in my, like, I'm working on a memoir right now. And I, I, I'm using some difficult language because it's a memoir of my mother having died on the island and my having to uh, educate myself in the language of the hospitals and, and stuff like that. So, so uh, I try to incorporate some, you know, um, uh, explanations into the text. But with poetry, I feel like, you know, when, when, uh, you know, uh, the great poets decide that they're going to use uh, a French word in their poem, they don't inhibit themselves. You know, they go mm -hmm. ahead and do it, mm -hmm. or Latin, or, or whatever. Uh, I think that, that we do not trust the readers enough. For example, the word embargo in English means, um, you know, a ban, right, or a prohibition. In Spanish, one of the most often used uh, phrases is sin embargo, usually followed by a shrug of the shoulders, means but in, in other words, or in any case, you know, and so I figured that because of the context of it, I started sentencing in Bargo, you know, that the reader would be curious enough mm. to look it up if, if they don't know it. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I decided a long time ago that I wasn't going to give in to that demand that everyone be catered to 
uh, even the youngest students. I have Spanish words in my uh, stories that are in the anthologies. Um, and I just figured that it could be a teaching moment. Mm -hmm. The teacher could say, well, you don't know what embargo means? Let's go look it up, mm -hmm. you know? Let's find it. So anyway, that may sound arrogant to you, but I feel that Southern writers, for example, when I first saw the word persnickety in a story, <laughs> I think it was may, may have been Flannery O'Connor, and some of the language that she uses, you know, uh, I couldn't find them in the dictionary. I had to turn to my husband, you know. I, I remember what he, uh, he pointed out to a little puppy crossing the road and says, look at that thing go lickety split. Mm. I said, what did you say? <laughs> he said, lickety split. I said, can you spell it? She said, he says, well, I've never had to spell it before. Let me see, you know. And now, uh, or one time he said, I feel puny. I said, for God's sake, you're the biggest human being I've ever met. Why should you feel small? Mm. You know, and it, you know, so our marriage has worked because of the constant translation issue, mm -hmm. you know, but so you see what I'm talking about? If you decide to use parsnickety, lickety, split, or puny in the sense of like sick, mm -hmm. do you feel like you have to define it? Mm -hmm. It's part right, right. of the context of your life, and nobody asked Faulkner to define parsnickety. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, I mean, I'm, that, with all I'm in the same and with all you <laughs> and all that. So, so you know, you know what I'm talking about is like you speak a different language than the people in Boston. Do you not? You're all Americans, but you certainly don't sound like the Minnesotans I've met. You, you know, so you have to in your writing, you should reflect your natural voice, right? And that's what I'm doing. But my natural voice involves Spanish. So. Well, you, the assignment, if any of you who are not in the class want to, would like to take it up, is I've asked the students for, for, by tomorrow at 9.15 a.m. Oh to go come home. with a poem where they meditate, like a dom turning a domino over, but meditate on a turn of phrase that's uh, familiar to their vernacular, just as you've talked. So uh -huh. I think you just gave us some ideas. We could uh, right. I mean, meditate it's, it's, on it's, so, it's so rich, you know? Um, you know, it, uh, I'm always laughing at the things. Uh, that my husband says, we live in the country. So, you know, there are certain jokes about bears in the woods and stuff, you know, that I won't repeat here, but <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I'll say something and immediately he comes up with something, you know, like completely Southern, you know, uh, it's so rich, you know, so it's, it's such a rich vernacular. Uh, if, if you want to relish it completely, read the letters of uh, Flannery O'Connor, who was brilliant. She was so wise and she could outdo the Pope in theology, but she still used the Southern vernacular like nobody's business, mm -hmm. you know? And I relish it, you know? It's delicious. Mm -hmm. so. I have one last question. Okay. The question is, a lot of people think poetry is dour, that it's, you know, you, you write poetry if you're grieving, if you're unhappy. Um, and a lot of your poems are, have dark yeah, themes. So, you know, as a teacher coming to write a poem, sometimes people, I don't want to go there. I don't want to feel that emotion. Right. What, what do you, how do you respond to that? Not, fe you know, to, to not feel deeply is to not know yourself, you know. Uh, for me, poetry is, is a revelation. Uh, when I um, was writing the poem Dominoes for my father, uh, you know, I've always grieved for him in a different way than for anybody else because I didn't get to know him. I had to imagine his life. And so uh, th that poem to me is a, is a grieving poem. And I have several for him that way in which I try to imagine his loneliness. You know, as a, as, as a youngster, I only saw him as distant, authoritative, military, a little frightening, you know. And when I got into that poem and imagined him in a ship where he was the only Latino, this is the 60s, and carrying his box of dominoes and never being able to find anybody to play mm -hmm. with him, you know what I mean? I'm not trying to get maudlin here, but it gave me a way to love my father, you know, that I didn't have before. Mm -hmm. I saw him as a lonely, man who was doing that because it was the only way he had to make a living so that I could get the education that he wanted for me. So before, before poetry, I saw things the way that they were presented to me by other people or the way that culture had dictated that I see them. 
after poetry, I see that I have a, a, a well deep inside me, and I always compare this, you know, people, I've never been in therapy, but I have friends, mostly Northerners, who, like, you know, they go into therapy like in their 20s, you know, and go for like 30 years. I've made a discovery about myself, you know, $100,000 later. And, uh, you know, and they tell me, I learned that I love my father after all. I said, guess what? You could write poetry, you know, and, and find that out. I, I know that sounds like an exaggeration, but to me, poetry has been a delving deep into my psyche. And sometimes I discover things that I don't want to know. But why wouldn't you want to know yourself, you know, even if it's dark? You know? So I don't know if that was the question you were asking. Uh, and I'm writing right now, I'm writing a full length, I call it a cultural elegy. My mother died in 2011, and I had to immerse myself back in my culture and my language. And I stayed with her and gave her the Catholic funeral that she wanted. Mm. And I found out something in writing this book. I'm no longer from there. Mm. You know, I am here, and I belong here, and I, I will never look like a, you know, the Georgia peach. But like my husband says, I'm a Georgia mango. <laughs> he, he says, that is a fruit that cannot exist in nature, but we just have to imagine it, you know. So, um, so it, you know, like while I was grieving for my mother, I was writing this book in which I said, I always say I'm from Puerto Rico, but that was where I, my soul and my dream life are, but my actual life is in Georgia. You know, this is, this is where I feel at home now. But I wouldn't have learned that if I had not written the book. So, so now I don't have to ask, like, why am I getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning to do this useless thing that nobody you know, pays me for? Um, and now, now I know that, that like it, it was uh, as silly as this sounds, it was my quest for self-knowledge. It has always been that. Does that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I want to say thank you again for sharing yourself with us. Um, but I wanted to thank the College of Education for allowing me to do this and the, their great support, particularly Jim Marshall, Michael Childs, Jen Williams, and artistic tech guru Ron Braxley in the back. Um, I also want to thank my department head, Bob Fetcho, and the entire Department of Language and Literacy Education and my program from which I hail, TESOL, and World Language Education. I also want to thank all the poets that have read in this series, um, starting with Judith Ortiz Kofer. Stephen Corey, our greatest fan right there of the Georgia Review, and Jenny Graupess, also of the Georgia Review, Laura Newburn, Jericho Brown, and Tamara J. Madison. I want to thank Johan Huang for his extraordinary assistance in all things, including the beautiful flyer that you may have seen, which brought you here upstairs. Jim Woglum for his artistic support as well. Woodland Farms and Roots Farm for providing us with some amazing locally grown fresh vegetables to nourish us this week. And Tlaloc Restaurant, which helped us nourish us today. Wonderful, authentic Mexican cuisine. Of course, the Georgia Review, an awesome literary, nationally famous literary magazine in our very hometown. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe the English Literature and Creative Writing Programs at UGA, WUGA, for featuring many of our poets on the radio this week and to be rebroadcast in September. Of course, these featured readings will all be um, broadcast on the College of Education YouTube channel, so you can look forward to that. Ron is to credit for all of that, and so you can Google Misha's Poetry Podcast or College of Education YouTube channel podcast, and you can see all the readings if you missed any of them. And of course, this reading tonight will also be on air. I already thank these wonderful students in the class, Georgia teachers everywhere for the creative work they do and 
Um, of course, one other thing I forgot to mention is that we have taken poetry field trips um, many of the days of our course to inspire new writings. And I want to give a shout out to Katie and Lakeisha at the vet school who um, helped tour and guide us and inspire some animal poems you might hear. Ann Myers Divine at the Harvard Rare Book and Manuscript Library, whose um, documents have inspired some of the poems tonight. Andrea Swigert from Evolutionary Biology, who taught us a great deal about the monkey flower and genetics at the beautiful Botany Lab on campus. The Green Acres Pool, where we <laughs> swam today, some of us. And I also wanted to let you know that if you want to be a part of our group, um, we want you to be a part of our group. I have started a Facebook page called Poetry for Educators, but it's also for our and our friends. Um, I think educator and education is a term we can all, all feel a part of in many ways. We are a part of education, broadly speaking. So please sign up, Poetry for Educators. You just go to that group, and it's a closed group, but it's open to anyone, and we welcome you there.